Good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Iskander, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the October 2012 session of CDC's Public Health Grand Rounds. As a reminder, continuing education credits for Grand Rounds are available for multiple professional disciplines. For more information, please consult the Grand Rounds website. Uh, Grand Rounds also has an active and growing social media presence, as noted here. Uh, today's session on reducing U.S. infant mortality was developed in conjunction with the American Academy of Pediatrics in recognition of Child Health Month. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the interest and effort of the AAP in bringing this session together. We've also partnered with the CDC Public Health Library to feature scientific articles relevant to infant mortality. This month's selections made by, are made by Captain Wanda Barfield, uh, without whose vision and leadership this session could not have happened. Uh, the selections are available at cdc.gov slash science clips. Uh, today's CDC speakers include Dr. Wanda Barfield and Ms. Denise D'Angelo. Uh, CDC is pleased to welcome Dr. Rachel Moon, representing the American Academy of Pediatrics. As you all can see, she literally wrote the book on her topic. And as you can also see, Dr. Michael Liu brings real-world experience to his work developing a national strategy on infant mortality. Um, I would like to recognize uh, in our um, live audience here um, the uh, Georgia State uh, nursing students. We welcome them. And it's now my pleasure to introduce the CDC director, Dr. Thomas Frieden. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to have another session of Public Health Grand Rounds, and it's a crucially important topic. It's been said that the infant mortality rate is the most sensitive indicator of overall societal health, and by that indicator, we have a long way to go. Uh, the infant mortality rate indicates not only what happens in the healthcare system, what, but what happens in society more generally, and in particular, how society cares for women and children. We've seen progress, but there remain far too many preventable infant deaths in this country. And I think we have three key challenges to address. The first is to move from recognition of this very serious problem to specific actionable things that we can do that will make a difference. The second is addressing disparities. African-American infants in this country still die at twice the rate of white infants, and that's completely unacceptable. And we need to do everything possible to end disparities, not just in infant mortality, but in other aspects of health in the U.S. And uh, that we have a huge challenge with disparities, not only within the U.S., but with other countries. We rank 30th or 31st internationally. Our rate is three times the lowest infant mortality rate in the world. Um, so a second challenge after finding specific things we can do is addressing disparities so that those specific things particularly address our overall status with regard to infant mortality in the world and the status of the most disadvantaged populations in the U.S. And third, we need to figure out how to effectively connect with the healthcare system to prioritize and put into practice key interventions, including things such as reducing unnecessary induction and primary cesarean section. Our primary cesarean section rate is shockingly high. It is quite a bit higher than it needs to be or should be for either maternal or child health. There are many reasons for that, but uh, resolving and addressing those reasons will be very important. Uh, Fifty years ago, JFK said, the needs of children should not be made to wait. And really, there's no better theme for addressing infant mortality and giving every child a healthy start than that concept of making sure that we're doing everything we can so that every single child born in this country has the best possible opportunity to live a long, healthy, and productive life. I want to thank Dr. Wanda Barfield for her leadership in this and many other crucial areas in reproductive and child health. 
Uh, also thank the AAP, which has been a wonderful longtime partner uh, with uh, CDC and with public health and public health departments around the country. And thank Dr. Liu from uh, HRSA, who's a critical partner in promoting maternal health in this country. So thank you all very much, maternal and child health in this country. I'd now like to introduce our first pr presenter, Dr. Wanda Barfield. Good afternoon, everyone. So, where do we stand when it comes to infant mortality in the U.S.? I'd simply like to start with a story. In 1963, a woman delivered a baby boy at an emergency, via emergency C-section at a local hospital, and he was transferred to a larger Boston hospital. She delivered her baby at just over 34 weeks, five weeks early, weighing 11, 10 grams, or four pounds, 12 ounces. Her son, though more normally formed, had great difficulty breathing from the start and died two days later of a prematurity-related lung disease known as Highland Membrane Disease. This young baby boy was named Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, second son of President John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. Now, I'd like you to fast forward to 2001. A woman is transported to a hospital here in Georgia in preterm labor. She delivers a baby boy at about 34 weeks gestation or about six weeks before her due date. Before this baby's early arrival, she is given a shot to help her baby's lungs mature more rapidly, and she's also given medications to slow down the labor. Her baby boy is delivered and breathes normally and is discharged home in five days. This young boy's name is Joseph, my first son, born to me and my husband, Joe. So I have a very personal experience of the wonders of what modern technology has done to reduce infant mortality. Yet the US, despite all this wonderful technology, has a relatively poor standing in infant mortality. Now infant mortality is defined as the death of a live-born infant before his or her first birthday. And it's often divided into two time periods. The neonatal period, which is the period from birth through the first 27 days of life, and the post-neonatal period, from 28 days to 364 days of life. And infant mortality is the largest component of childhood mortality, the period where children are most vulnerable to the consequences of birth, infection, and injury. Understanding when babies die allow us to better understand opportunities for intervention. So neonatal death, or the death of a live-born infant at less than 28 days of age, compromises, uh, comprises about two-thirds of all infant deaths and is driven primarily by preterm birth, birth defects, maternal health conditions and complications of labor and delivery, and the lack of access to appropriate care. Prevention opportunities are often related to the health of mothers, even prior to conception, the health of mothers during pregnancy, and the care of infants soon after delivery. Now post neonatal deaths, those that occur between 28 and 364 days of life, comprise a third of all infant deaths and are driven by sudden unexpected infant death or sudden infant death syndrome, injury, and infection. The prevention opportunities are often in homes and communities. Many of these infants are term, although increasingly these infants are former preterm infants who survived the neonatal period. Over the last several decades, U.S. infant mortality has made substantial declines from 26 infant deaths per 1,000 live births in 1960 to 6.05 infant deaths per 1,000 live births in 2011. Yet a compelling statistic still remains. Black, non-Hispanic infants still die at more than twice the rate of white non-Hispanic infants. A major contributor 
in the decline in U.S. infant mortality is due to declines in the risk of death for younger and younger gestational ages or birth weights over time, as illustrated here. As you can see here, infants of smaller birth weights have a lower risk of death since 1950 and 1985. So an infant born in 2008 weighing less than 1,000 grams has a 60% chance of surviving the neonatal period. A baby about the size of my firstborn son who weighed 2,100 grams has over a 98% chance of survival. Yet the major driver of infant mortality, birth weight, which is often a reflection of gestational age or maturity, has not changed substantially over time. In fact, most recently, birth weights have shifted to the left, due in part to deliveries at earlier gestational ages, due to increasing antenatal monitoring and testing, earlier deliveries both indicated and not so indicated, and as well as the changes in the health status of women. And as a result, the US collectively ranks poorly in infant mortality. This slide shows the international rankings of infant mortality among selected developed countries in 2008. And here the US ranks about 28. The main cause of the US's high infant mortality rate when compared to Europe is the high percentage of preterm births in the US, the period when infant mortality is greatest. And within the US, there are significant differences in infant mortality rates by states. In fact, the top quartile of US infant mortality rates is almost entirely in the 13 US southern states. States with the highest rates are shown in red on this map. In 2010, state health officials in regions four and six, which represent the southernmost US states, met together to address the issue of infant mortality and what we could do to prevent it. This will be discussed by our last speaker. This table shows the underlying causes of infant death listed by percentage and rate per thousand live births from the US from 2008 using Adolphus classification. These underlying causes of death during the neonatal period include disorders related to short gestation or low birth weight, which generally comprises preterm birth and is the underlying cause for over 25% of deaths, followed by congenital malformations, deformations, and chromosomal anomalies at 22% of underlying neonatal causes which also is followed by complications of pregnancy, the placenta cord and membranes, and sepsis. Underlying causes of neonatal deaths, of postneonatal deaths, include SIDS at 22%, congenital malformations at 16%, and unintentional injuries at 12%. We cannot reduce the US infant mortality rate until we figure out how to reduce the rate of preterm birth. Preterm birth, as defined as births less than 27 completed weeks of gestation, is the most frequent cause of infant death, accounting for two-thirds of all infant deaths in 2007. Every year, nearly one-half million American babies are born too soon. Approximately 12% of US births are preterm. And although these have been, although we've seen some recent declines, this is still far too high. The data here illustrate the importance of preterm birth and particularly its contribution to US disparities in infant mortality. Among the major causes of death, Preterm related causes represent a large proportion of the deaths to non Hispanic black infants and represents much of the racial disparity in the US. Preterm related death causes more than three times more deaths to non Hispanic black infants compared to non Hispanic white infants. And although not as wide, disparities in these leading causes of deaths are also seen for Native American infants 
and subgroups of Hispanic infants, such as Puerto Ricans, compared to non-Hispanic white infants. Our nation's tiniest babies bear the biggest burden, and over half of infant deaths occur among infants less than 32 weeks gestation. Given these young gestational ages, our efforts for prevention of preterm birth must start much earlier than pregnancy and prenatal care. The societal costs of preterm birth are huge as these infants are not only at increased risk of death, but as survivors, they are at increased risk for complications of the respiratory, cardiovascular, GI, and immunologic systems. And they also have long-term consequences that include motor, cognitive, and behavioral problems. The annual societal costs associated with preterm birth in the U.S. is at least $26.2 billion in 2005. Preterm birth is also a major contributor to the poor international rankings, and the U.S. ranks 130 out of 184. Until we find a way to prevent preterm births altogether, we must maintain the gains in the provision of risk-appropriate care for high-risk newborns. Data over the last three decades demonstrates the effectiveness of a system of care that places the smallest and highest-risk newborns in facilities best equipped to care for them, a level three neonatal intensive care unit. A meta-analysis of over 30 years of data involving 105,000 very low birth weight infants shows the increased odds of death prior to discharge for those small infants who are born outside of a level three NICU. Yet in the US, many of these infants are not born at a level three facilities. Prenatal smoking is another opportunity to reduce infant mortality. It occurs in 11.5% of all US births. And it's estimated that five to 8% of preterm deliveries, 13 to 19% of term low birth weight deliveries are attributable to smoking in pregnancy. In terms of infant mortality, 23 to 34% of deaths due to SIDS and 5 to 7% of deaths due to preterm related causes are attributable to prenatal smoking. These deaths are preventable. So what are we doing in the US about the problem of infant mortality? Well, recently a lot. In 2012, as part of the work led by Dr. David Lakey, the former president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and colleagues in the 13 US southern states, there was an initiation of a president's challenge, which aimed to reduce infant mortality through the five pre prevention areas listed here. The health of babies depends on the health of not only the mother, but on the health of fathers, families, and communities. Our next speaker will provide information about how a broad understanding of the health of mothers before, during, and after pregnancy can provide insights to help prevent infant mortality. I now like to introduce Ms. Denise D'Angelo. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barfield. I'm happy to be here today to talk about the surveillance system that's been the best source of data on mothers and babies for the past 25 years, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. PRAMS is a population-based surveillance system that collects self-reported information from new mothers on their behaviors and experiences before, during, and shortly after pregnancy. PRAMS data supplements birth certificate information and can be used to provide state level and near national level estimates, given that not all states participate in PRAMS. Information from surveys such as PRAMS can add to the depth of our understanding of personal behaviors and other influences on the health of women and infants, including their impact on infant mortality. PRAMS was established in 1987 as part of an infant health initiative 
when congressional funding was provided to CDC to establish state-based programs. The overall goal of PRAMS is to reduce maternal and infant morbidity and mortality by collecting information that can be used to influence maternal and infant health programs, health policies, and maternal behaviors. PRAMS participants are women who recently delivered a live infant. Women are randomly sampled from birth certificate records when their infants are between two and six months of age. Each state samples between 1,500 and 3,000 women per year. PRAM surveillance is currently active in 40 states in New York City with a combined annual sample of about 77,000 women per year. Because PRAMS is population-based, we're able to generalize the information provided by those few thousand women in each state to the entire population of women who gave birth in that state each year. Conceptually, each respondent represents a certain number of other simi similar individuals in the population. This slide shows the current PRAM sites, which cover approximately 78% of U.S. live births. The majority of women participate in PRAMs by responding to a mailed survey. While each state survey is different, the survey booklet is limited to 14 pages and fits roughly 70 to 90 questions. Women who do not respond to any of three mailed surveys are followed up by telephone. The survey by either mail or phone takes between 20 and 30 minutes to complete. The PRAM survey covers a wide range of topics, some of which are shown on this slide. I'd now like to share some PRAMS data on topics related to reducing infant mortality from 26 participating sites. And the first is smoking during pregnancy. Women are asked if they smoke during the last three months of their most recent pregnancy. In 2010, we see a range in the prevalence of smoking during pregnancy from 2.3% in New York City to 30.5% in West Virginia. This again demonstrates the value of state-specific data and highlighting large differences in underlying risk factors that may contribute to geographic differences in the infant mortality rate. PRAMs can also be used to identify demographic disparities in risk behavior, behaviors and help states effectively target program efforts. We combine the data from all states in 2010 to look at differences in smoking by race and age. Here we see that smoking during pregnancy does vary by race, with white mothers having the highest prevalence. By age, we see that younger mothers have the highest prevalence. The PRAM survey includes space at the end for women to write additional comments. This particular woman indicates that the message about not smoking during pregnancy did not resonate with her until it, is too, it was too late, and she hopes that others will hear the message. Another topic that is important to infant health is infant sleep position. Women are asked if they most often place their new baby down to sleep on the back, side, or stomach. This graph shows the percentage of women in each state that reported putting their baby down to sleep on the back most of the time. In 2010, the prevalence of infant back sleeping ranged from 65% in Georgia to 85.6% in Colorado. For placing the infant on his or her back to sleep most of the time, we see the highest prevalence among white mothers and older mothers. Some states also ask about the frequency of infant bed sharing, another known SID sewage risk factor. This graph shows data from 14 participating sites. In 2010, the prevalence of bed sharing ranged from 27.6% in Nebraska to 54.3% in Hawaii. The highest prevalence of infant bed sharing was found among black mothers and mothers of other races, as well as young mothers. I'd like to briefly talk about how states leverage this information to improve maternal and infant health and hopefully reduce infant mortality. West Virginia had the highest prevalence of women smoking during pregnancy in 2010, as we saw, and this was also true in 2009 when new efforts were underway to address the issue. The West Virginia Division of Tobacco Prevention and Office of Maternal Child and Family Health partnered with a media company to launch the Tobacco-Free Pregnancy Initiative. The initiative's goals included educating women of childbearing age and those who are pregnant on the dangers of using tobacco, 
and promoting the use of the existing West Virginia tobacco quit line by pregnant smokers and their families. The media campaign was launched by the governor and included 30-second television ads, billboards, and print ads. At the same time, the Division of Tobacco Prevention set a variety of additional programs in motion. In the first six weeks of the media campaign, the West Virginia Tobacco Quit Line received an increased number of calls and enrolled hundreds of callers in tobacco cessation programs, including approximately 100 pregnant women or family members. The next state example is from Michigan. A study conducted in Michigan in 2004 showed a reduction in the number of SIDS deaths, but no overall decline in the infant mortality rate. Further exploration into infant sleep environments using PRAMS data revealed that black women were 20% less likely to put their infants to sleep on their back. There was also a high prevalence of bed sharing, especially among younger women and those with less than a high school education. In response, the nonprofit organization Tomorrow's Child, in collaboration with the Michigan Department of Health, launched a new state-based infant sleep campaign endorsed by the governor and other high-level state officials. The group developed unified infant safe sleep recommendations, specifying exactly what should be considered a safe sleep environment and suggesting actions for parents, child care providers, and health care officials. Further activities were to integrate the safe sleep message into existing programs and services of the health department, set standards of care, policies, and procedures for hospitals, health plans, and state agencies, to link safe sleep practices to licensure for child care centers, and to develop consumer materials with a consistent message, including fact sheets, posters, postcards, and a checklist that describes and illustrates a safe sleep environment. Finally, I'd like to mention the possibility of data linkages as a means of combining relevant information from PRAMS and other data sources to gain a more complete picture of issues related to reducing infant mortality. Because PRAMS, like many other data sources, are associated with the infant birth record, linkages can be valuable for tracking and understanding infant and child health outcomes as the infant grows. With that, I'd like to conclude and leave you with the PRAMS website where you can learn more and access PRAMS data using the CPONDER online query system. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Rachel Moon. Good afternoon. So how big is the problem of sudden and unexpected infant death, or SUID? SUID is also referred to as SUDI, or sudden and unexpected death in infancy, and it accounts for approximately 4,500 U.S. deaths every year. The vast majority of these deaths occur during sleep or in sleep environments, and we're beginning to call these deaths sleep-related deaths. There are three primary categories for sleep-related deaths accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed, or ASSB, ill-defined deaths, and SIDS. SIDS is defined as a death in a previously healthy infant where no cause is found after a complete autopsy, death scene investigation, and review of the clinical history. It is the leading cause of death between one month and one year of age, and it comprises approximately half of all sewage deaths. ASSB and ill-defined deaths comprise the other half. When you look at post-neonatal deaths over the past 15 years, you'll see that the total number has remained stagnant since about 1997. As the proportion of SIDS has decreased, the proportion of both ASSB and the ill-defined deaths has increased. So we seem to be taking one step forward and then one step back. In all of the categories of SUID, we see racial disparities. This slide shows the rates of SIDS by race ethnicity in 1996, which are the black bars, and 2006, which are the gray bars. And as you can see, non-Hispanic blacks and American Indians, Alaska Natives, have much higher rates of SIDS than the other racial ethnic groups. We see the same pattern in ASSB deaths. On this slide and on the next slide, you can see these little A's 
And the A's mean that either no data were collected in that year for that racial ethnic group, as was true for the American Indian, Alaska Native, and the Hispanic groups, or that the numbers were too small to be counted. This was true for the Asian Pacific Islander group. And once again, you see similar racial and ethnic disparities in the ill-defined deaths. The potential explanations for the racial disparities in these deaths fall into two basic categories. There are biological differences. For instance, blacks metabolize nicotine differently from whites. So the same amount of nicotine causes more disease in a black person than in a white or an Asian person. And there may be other biological differences as well. There are also definitely behavioral differences. For instance, blacks are more likely to place babies on their stomach. They're more likely to bed share to use soft bedding, and they're less likely to breastfeed. American Indian, Alaska Native babies, uh, uh, parents are more likely to bed share with their babies, to use soft bedding, and to smoke. So for example, this graph breaks down the percentage of four racial ethnic groups that place their babies on their stomach. So at the top, you'll see the purple line. Um, that is for the non-Hispanic blacks. The turquoise line is for non-Hispanic whites. The white triangles represent the Hispanics. And then the black line with the X's represents the Asians. And you can see that non-Hispanic blacks at every single point in this graph between 1992 and 2008 have trended higher for placing babies on their stomachs. However, what's really distressing is that over the past few years, the proportion of blacks placing their babies on their stomach has nearly doubled. So in 2006, it was 21.9, and now it approaches 40%. All of the work done to determine risk fa factors and protective factors has been done through epidemiologic studies. You can see on this slide and the next the range of odds ratios for each of these factors. For instance, for side or prone position, the odds ratio has ranged in studies from 2.3 to 13.1. This means that you are 2.3 to 13.1 times more likely to die from SIDS if you are placed on the side or stomach for sleep. Other risk factors include soft bedding, prenatal and postnatal smoke exposure, and prenatal drug and alcohol use. I also want to specifically mention bed sharing. Bed sharing in and of itself increases the risk of SIDS almost threefold. And then there are certain situations under which bed sharing frequently occurs, which makes the risk of bed sharing skyrocket. These situations include when the parent is a smoker, even if she or he is not smoking in the bed, when the infant is less than three months old, regardless of whether the parent is a smoker or not, soft surfaces such as couches, armchairs, and waterbeds, soft bedding, such as pillows and blankets, when there are multiple bed shares besides the parents in the bed, including siblings, and when the parent has consumed alcohol, drugs, or is overtired. Protective, protective factors include room sharing without bed sharing, breastfeeding, pacifier use, and being immunized. Note that the protection offered by breastfeeding increases the more that you breastfeed. Based on these epidemiologic studies, the American Academy of Pediatrics published revised recommendations in November 2011. Level A recommendations are the strongest recommendations. The studies are the most robust, we're convinced that the net benefit is substantial, and the results have been very consistent. We therefore think that it is highly unlikely that the results of future studies will cause a change in these recommendations. So the level A recommendations are back to sleep for every sleep, use a firm sleep surface, room share without bed sharing, keep soft objects and loose bedding out of the crib, get regular prenatal care when you're pregnant, avoid smoke exposure during pregnancy and after birth, avoid alcohol and illicit drug use during pregnancy and after birth, breastfeed as much and for as long as you can. Additional level A recommendations include consider offering a pacifier at nap time and bedtime, Avoid overheating, 
Do not use home, respiratory, home cardiorespiratory monitors as a strategy for reducing the risk of SIDS. And expand the national campaign to include a major focus on the safe sleep environment and ways to reduce the risk of all sleep-related infant deaths. Level B recommendations are those that we're fairly confident about, but we're not quite sure if future studies will show something a little bit different and that these studies might not need to be tweaked as we get more evidence. So the level B recommendations are immunize your baby. And I just want to say that this level B recommendation is strictly for immunizations for the purpose of SIDS risk reduction. I think that everyone in this audience will agree that in general, immunization is a level A recommendation. Um, don't use commercial devices marketed to reduce the risk of SIDS and give your baby tummy time when he or she is awake and is supervised. Level C recommendations are based primarily on consensus and expert opinion. These recommendations include healthcare professionals, staff in newborn nurseries and NICUs, and childcare providers should endorse the SIDS risk reduction recommendations from birth. Media and manufacturers should follow safe sleep guidelines in their messaging and advertising, and continue research and surveillance on the risk factors, causes, and pathophysiological mechanisms of SIDS and other sleep-related infant deaths with the ultimate goal of eliminating these deaths entirely. There are multiple national initiatives that are promoting safe sleep out there. A few examples include Cribs for Kids, which has expanded from one site in Pittsburgh to more than 300 sites nationally. This program provides low-cost portable cribs to organizations who can then provide them free or at cost to parents who cannot afford a crib. Baltimore City Health Department and others have started the ABC campaign, which stands for three basic tenets of safe sleep, alone, on your back, in a crib. And last but not least, the Back to Sleep campaign, which many of you are familiar with, will be superseded by the Safe to Sleep Public Awareness Campaign. This will expand the focus from back sleeping only to all of the components of a safe sleep environment. So what can you do? First and foremost, patient and community education is critical. But it isn't enough to just tell people what to do. You need to explain why they need to do it, you need to know what the barriers are so that you can address them, and you need to convince parents that what they do can make a difference. You have to convince parents that SIDS is not fate or God's will, which is what many people believe, but that their decisions and their behaviors can make a difference. You also need to make sure that you are modeling safe sleep behaviors. I'm talking to all of you doctors, nurses, any other people who care for children. If you place a baby on the side or the stomach, even if you just prop the baby a little bit to the side, you're sending a message to the parent. And that message is, I'm doing this because either A, I don't think it's important to put babies on the back, or B, I don't think that your baby's at risk for this, so you don't need to do this. Finally, keep track of what's being said and shown to parents in the press. Pictures of sleeping babies in advertisements, TV shows, movies, and celebrity photos can be powerful influences. Many times these come from companies or people who are trusted sources for parents. So when you see things like this, you need to speak up. Call the company, talk to the store manager, write a letter to the editor. We have to all remember that a picture is worth a thousand words. Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to now <laughs> introduce the last speaker, who's Dr. Michael Liu. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. I'm very honored to be invited to speak at this grand round. I was asked to talk about what we can do as a nation to address infant mortality. Now, as most of you are aware, the Secretary announced at the Global Summit on Child Survival back in June that the Department will be uh, working on creating our, our nation's first ever national strategy to address infant mortality. Now, this is big. Okay? The last time we had this kind of national resolve to, to address infant mortality, I was still in medical school. That was back in the mid 
1980s or early 1990s, and that national resolve led to a vast expansion of Medicaid coverage for prenatal care. Now, this time, the, the Secretary's uh, announcement didn't just come out of nowhere. It built on the groundswell of initiatives, national, state, and local, that's been growing over the last several years. First, you have ASTO, who really sparked this movement with the Healthy Babies Initiative that's now spreading like wildfire. 49 states, Puerto Rico, and the District of Columbia have taken the pledge to reduce prematurity rate by 8% over the next three years. Earlier this year, CMS, CMMI, launched the Strong Start Initiative, and we at HRSA, in partnership with CDC and other partners, have launched the Collaborative Improvement and Innovation Network, or COIN, amongst the 13 southern states that I'll talk about in just a little bit. Okay. And all of these efforts, federal, state, and local, okay, have contributed to a steady decline in infant mortality, about 3% per year for four years straight. If we keep this up, if we keep this up, we could actually get to 5.5 by 2015 and 4.5 by 2020. So imagine that, okay? United States with an infant mortality rate below 4.5 deaths per 1,000 live births. Okay? So we're at the beginning of a, a national movement to finally do something about infant mortality in our nation. I think the Secretary's call for a national strategy is indeed very timely. And who better to advise the Secretary on this national strategy than the Secretary's own advisory committee on infant mortality? Now, although SACM is an independent body that reports directly to the Secretary, it is administered by HRSA, and therefore I've been privy to its progress. And while it's still a work in progress, let me just highlight for you some of the key priorities that have been identified by SACM uh, for the national strategy. First is to improve women's health before pregnancy. I think this is going to be the game changer this time. Okay. For two decades, prenatal care has been the cornerstone of our national strategy on infant mortality. Efforts both at the federal and state level in the mid-80s to early 1990s to expand Medicaid coverage for prenatal care led to significant increases in prenatal care utilization but not significant improvement in birth outcomes. Now, this is not to take anything away from prenatal care. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Today, many of us are beginning to recognize that if we really want to improve pregnancy outcomes in the United States, we start by improving women's health before pregnancy. Since 2005, CDC has led this national movement to improve preconception health and healthcare in the United States. Again, I think the game changer this time is going to be the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Beginning August of this year with impl implementation of the preventive services for, for, for women, millions of women are going to gain access to health care even when they're not pregnant, including coverage for preconception and interconception care without copay. And I think that provides an extraordinary opportunity to improve women's health not only during those nine months of pregnancy, but before pregnancy, between pregnancy, beyond pregnancy, and indeed across their life course. Second, promote quality and safety in perinatal health care. I think this is where we made the most progress over the last few years with reduction of early elective deliveries, and there's still certainly plenty of room for quality improvement, uh, ranging from appropriate use of 17P to improving screening for asymptomatic bacteriuria and GBS to re reducing central line infections. We also know that better care can lead to better outcomes and lower costs. Look what states like Ohio and Kentucky and Louisiana uh, are, are doing okay, with the uh, adoption of a simple uh, a few simple quality improvement measures, they've been able to reduce elective deliveries and at the same time reduce NICU emissions in just 12 to 18 months. Better care, better outcomes, lower costs. Third, invest in prevention and health promotion. I think this is where we can still do a lot better. There are still too many missed opportunities to reduce infant mortality with prevention and promotion, such as smoking cessation, safe sleep, breastfeeding, immunization, and family planning. 
And the committee's been talking about the use of new workforce like community health workers or doulas, new platforms such as group prenatal care, and new technologies such as social media, uh, text for baby, uh, for prevention and promotion. Fourth, promote service coordination and systems integration. The committee talked about integration along three dimensions, vertical, horizontal, and longitudinal. Vertical integration in terms of appropriate levels of care, horizontal integration in terms of service coordination and systems integration, and longitudinal integration in terms of that continuum of care across the life course. This is what perinatal regionalization is all about. Right? Making sure that the high-risk babies are born in hospitals with NICUs that are equipped to take care of high-risk babies and high-risk moms are cared for in hospitals that are equipped to take care of high-risk moms. And this is what our home visiting program is all about, making sure that, there are, that there's good uh, care coordination, not only within healthcare, but across systems. Fifth, strengthen surveillance and supporting research. We're now in 2012, and we still can't get all the states to use the 2003 birth certificates. We need standardized vital records. We need to improve state capacity to, to link data, such as linking uh, Medicaid claims data with vital statistics. And we need to figure out how to better promote quality improvement using real-time surveillance data. And while we know enough to act today, there's still a lot that we don't know. So the committee talked about the need to support more research and more disparities research, especially translational research. I'm not just talking about the T1 to T2 from, from the bench to, to the bedside, but more important, the T2 to T3 from bedside to curbside, or T3 to T4 from curbside to policy, so that we can accelerate the translation of knowledge to practice and policy. And six, to promote interagency, public-private, multidisciplinary collaboration. We're not going to win this fight against infant, against infant mortality by working in silos. I think that the coin that I mentioned earlier serves as a, a good example. The coin really started off as a, a summit uh, back in January where we brought the teams from uh, the 13 southern states together. In most cases, not, you, you have in the teams not only your Title V M MCH directors, but also the public health uh, uh, officers, uh, Medicaid directors, uh, key staff from the state legislature and the governor's office, community and professional leaders. So in essence, all the people who could really do something about infant mortality in their states. So the teams went to work and they developed their state plans at, at five common strategies emerged that Dr. Barfield talked about. And, and what was also clear from the summit was that states were really interested in learning from each other. So how was Georgia able to get its 1115 waiver for interconception care? Or how did North Carolina manage to build a statewide network of pregnancy medical homes? Okay. The 13 states shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel 13 times, and so we thought we would bring the whole science of collaborative improvement and innovation to help support their effort. So we built a coin, okay. collaborative improvement and innovation network that's built around these teams. Okay. So one team for each strategy. So we've got five teams. Each team is uh, led by uh, uh, content experts. So for example, uh, Dr. Barfield co-leads our perinatal regionalization team. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kerry uh, uh, Mendoza, uh, Shapiro Mendoza uh, co-leads uh, our safe sleep team. And they're supported by method experts, data experts, a shared workspace with a data dashboard that can provide real-time data to drive real-time improvement. So over the last few months, the team's been working mostly in cyberspace. They've been working on, on their aims and strategies and metrics and driver diagram. And now they're setting up their data dashboard so that they can begin to track improvement over time. And our goal here is to, to scale this up into a national initiative uh, by, by next year. Now throughout all of these discussions, okay, achieving health equity has been an overarching goal uh, for our national strategy. The committee talked about the need to develop aspiration goal, not only for our infant mortality rate, but also for our infant mortality gap. Recognizing that strategies to address, to reduce infant mortality rate may not be the same as strategies to close the infant mortality gap. The committee is also adopting the life course perspective as a guiding framework, recognizing that there are multiple de uh, determinants 
operating the cross of the life course, that may be the real drivers of disparities in maternal and child health. Poverty and housing and education and father absence and racism. Addressing these social determinants will require supporting more place-based initiatives that are working across multiple sectors, health, education, economic development, and community development. And addressing these social determinants will also require working at the policy level. And the committee's been talking about the inclusion of anti-poverty programs, such as TANF reauthorization, as part of the national strategy to address infant mortality. So let me just conclude with one final thought about infant mortality. If you think about it, infant mortality is really more than, than, than just an accounting of infant deaths. And it's really more than just an indicator of community health or social inequality. Ultimately, infant mortality is a measure of how much we fail the greatness of this nation. It's a greatness to sum up in a simple declaration some 236 years ago that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, and that are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's a greatness that's made by a simple promise that everyone gets a fair shot, no matter where you're from, or the family that you're born into, or the color of your skin. It's a greatness that's told in simple dreams as we tell our children when we tuck them in the night that when you grow up, you get to be anything you want to be. Well, America gave me and my family that chance. Those of you who know my story know that my parents will, pro will probably never get invited to give a grand round like this because they never went to college. In fact, in my mom's case, she actually never went to high school or even junior high. See, my mom was only 11 when her father died. So as, as the oldest girl in the family, she had to drop out of fifth grade to go, work in the to, to go work in the factory to help support the family. So I didn't come from an educated family or a wealthy family. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter because in a great America, you don't have to be rich to go to the best schools. And in a great America, everyone gets a fair shot, no matter where you're from, or the family that you're born into, or the color of your skin. And in a great America, I knew that if I just work hard enough and try hard enough, I can give my girls a better life, the kind of life that, that my mom could never even dare dream of. And that my two little girls, the granddaughters of a girl who had to drop out of fifth grade to go work in the factory, can now grow up in a nation where they get to be anything they want to be. That's a true testament to the greatness that is America. But if my girls can get that chance, why shouldn't every child born in America get the same chance? If my girls can get a fair shot, why shouldn't every child get a fair shot? This is really what we're fighting for, right? It's not simply a fight against infant mortality. It's a fight for what we're all about as a nation, as a people. The Maternal and Child Health Bureau has been fighting this fight for 100 years, dating back to the establishment of the Children's Bureau back in 1912. I'm proud and humbled to be leading the Bureau in this fight now, and I ask you to join me. If you believe in America's greatness, if you believe that every child deserves a fair shot, please join me in this fight. Let's close the gaps once and for all, and let's win this fight against infant mortality for our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We'd now like to open the session up for questions. 
Thank you very much. A great uh, panel session, a lot of information that uh, establishes the burden, the problem, um, the imperative to address it. Um, you laid out a number of initiatives from the broad federal um, initiatives to the very specific clinical initiatives. Can you give us some feel for attributable risk? If we were successful in getting all the level A AAP recommendations implemented, how much of this problem could we address? And if some of the initiatives that you spoke to um, at, a, at a more national level were implemented fully, how do we know how effective and how much of this problem we could address? Well, I think that um, if you look at, if you just look at smoking during pregnancy, it's been estimated that the population attributable risk um, with smoking and SIDS is something like 40%. So if we could totally eliminate smoking during pregnancy, that would be huge. Um, and, and there haven't been population attributable risk calculated for everything, but, but many of these um, risk factors have really quite remarkably large um, population attributable risk. Side sleeping actually has a larger population attributable risk than um, prone sleeping. If we get rid of side sleeping, probably 30% of babies would not die. I think the honest answer is that we, we, we don't know. I think there are uh, things like uh, smoking cessation, things like safe sleep that, that we do know. We do have evidence-based uh, strategies, but at the same time, we've got to continue to work on you know, figuring out interventions that, that, that really work, uh, not only at the clinical level, but, but really at the community and population-based level. Other questions? Yes, for one of our Twitter followers. Why is the top quarter of U.S. infant mortality rates almost entirely in the 13 southern states? So the question is about uh, disparities geographically in the United States. And the work that's been done by the 13 U.S. states have shown that the majority is due to preterm birth, and particularly very preterm birth, as well as Sid Suid. So again, there are really some opportunities for interventions. And each of the states are really assessing those areas. And so that's, that's part of the driver behind the, the five areas that were selected. Another question? I have a question. It's kind of a follow-up to that um, 13 states question. Um, whenever I see the infant mortality maps, I'm surprised by how much they mirror the obesity maps. Um, and I'm wondering why. Um, if it was just like an oversight, I really didn't hear that in the conversation as an opportunity for prevention. Um, and I think that it may play a role. So I, I think that's an important question and it leads to the broader issue and that is the health of women. So we know in addition to issues related to infant mortality that the health of our nation and many of these indicators including obesity is of significant concern. And so certainly we have to understand that you know, the health of women prior to pregnancy contribute to these birth outcomes. So particular issues that are related to, for example, preterm birth include obesity, overweight, gestational diabetes and diabetes in pregnancy, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, all related to issues related to diet and obesity. So I think your point is well taken. And I think as we also continue to do work to understand the health of women of reproductive age, we're seeing a lot of underlying chronic disease that includes things like being you know, overweight in addition to obesity. Yes, another question. What, what is the basis for the relationship between sleeping position and SIDS? A lot of the work um, looking at sleep position and SIDS has to do with arousal. And, um, and it appears that um, a lot of the newest research that's come out is, has looked at brainstem abnormalities and, and brainstem neurotransmitters. And, um, and it looks like there are some neurotransmitters that may be, um, there may be a deficiency in some of these babies that um, are deficient, um, particularly serotonin. Um, and so when you have serotonin deficiency in, in your brainstem, you may not arouse quite as well. And when you sleep on your stomach, 
you sleep more deeply and you sleep longer and it's harder to wake you up. And so if you are on your back, um, you're, um, you're more easily aroused. And, and so what we think is going on is that for a lot of these babies, when they're lying on their stomachs, that they can't arouse, um, particularly these vulnerable babies who have this arousal defect, they can't arouse when they need to, um, to ch kind of change their position if they're becoming a little hypoxic or, or hypercarbonate, hi hypercapnic. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank all of our, our presenters for a, a, a truly out, outstanding session. Uh, please uh, join us in uh, four weeks uh, for our next uh, grand rounds on injection safety. Thank you all very much.